Welcome to Side Alpha Leadership, a podcast where leaders can share their experiences and discuss what leadership means to them. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Hello and welcome to this month's episode of Side Alpha Leadership. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Today I am delighted to have two of my buddies here live in the studio um, together. Gonna, together, first time in probably two years <laughs> I've actually had people in here. So, uh, but um, oh, I've got uh, Sam Villani, uh, battalion chief of Montgomery County, longtime friend, Capital Fire instructor, and uh, Robert James, officially known as RJ, who is the president of Capital Fire, longtime friend, volunteer in, in uh, Montgomery County, as well as career lieutenant in Frederick. So, guys, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Dave. Glad to be here. Thanks so, for allowing us to come in your gaming studio. <laughs> <laughs> you got his headphones over there. Action, Xbox action. controllers yeah. still sitting on the couch. Slay some people in World of Warcraft, man. I have to, I have to admit that, uh, that my son has take, taken over the studio on the gaming side. So I have to boot him out when we do the podcast. But he lives down here playing all kinds of different stuff. So... But anyway, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about talk a little bit about conflict resolution as it comes to being an officer um, in leadership roles uh, in the fire service, in the business world, in the military, police, whatever. Um, but moreover, I want to hone in on something that we're all familiar with in the fire side is um, we talk about combination systems. Um, and for those that don't know, a combination system is where you have career firefighters and volunteer firefighters in the same organization working to achieve one mission, which is to serve the citizens of the county or the township or whatever where, where, they, uh, where, they, where they work and or volunteer. Um, but with that, because you have two separate entities that are working together, you rub into some conflict. And uh, you know, I've been around long enough you know, in Montgomery County when I w- was uh, coming through the ranks we have some some conflicts between career and and volunteer. It wasn't all one side; it was both sides. Um, in my new uh, position in uh, Frederick County as as uh, assistant chief of volunteer services, we, we we're bumping into some career volunteer conflicts, and I think that that's always going to happen when you have two type A personality entities working together to achieve the same goal. Um, I think vying for space. And uh, one thing I try to make sure people understand in the fire service is that there's room for everybody. And um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we went through in Montgomery County and how we actually resolved a lot of these conflicts and then, uh, you know, get some perspective from RJ being, you know, career and volunteer, Sam, who was a longtime volunteer, who's now career, and myself, who's still career and, and still volunteer. Um, so without me continually rambling on, uh, I just want to throw it out there. So when you came on, Sam, you started off as a volunteer. You were in, uh, for lack of better words, in Ocean City, Maryland. That was a combination system. You had career guys. It was predominantly volunteer, though. Did you bump into any conflicts there? Um, and if you did, what were they and how... How did you resolve, or was there a resolution? I know, I know your dad, your second generation, at least maybe third generation uh, firefighter. So I know your dad had a, a, a lot, of, a big hand into a lot of that stuff as well. Yeah, no, uh, fourth generation Ocean City and third generation Ocean City Volunteer Fire Company, and I, I tell you, man, and maybe it's just because they they shielded any any of that stuff from me. Um, uh, growing up as a kid, the career uh, fire EMS division and uh, the Ocean City Volunteer Fire Company got along. Uh, like one big family and you know it's, it's very you know sometimes it's cliche and you hear that and you roll your eyes but I mean that collective entity raised me um I didn't know the only the, the only way you knew the difference uh usually was uh you know if they were on duty uh the, the career fire MS division folks wore a uh, a dark blue helmet which actually was a pretty cool cool hue for a leather helmet mm-hmm. pretty awesome um but you know they attended the meetings, uh, all the social stuff. Like I never, I never was. I can't. I can't remember a gathering, uh, a fire department gathering down there as a kid where both weren't involved. And a lot of times, uh, a good majority of the folks were either volunteers, a career fire EMS, were volunteers in Ocean City, and also or volunteers uh, in neighboring jurisdictions. So, but uh, a- after I left there, um, 
stopped volunteering regularly uh, into the early 90s, moved to Gaithersburg as a college live-in, saw a lot of it there. Um, there was, a, you know, I think a lot of changes in our department in Montgomery County started around then. And, um, and my home department had some growing pains because they, they became unionized. Uh, they, they just, you know, one career fire chief um, over, over everything. And um, I, I'm kind of glad I missed that in Ocean City I, 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 uh, because I, I still remember Ocean City the way I remember as a kid, that fire department being literally like my family. I mean, I, I owe so much to that department. Um, but I know they went through a tough, they went through a tough spot. Uh, I, I witnessed it here, you know, in Montgomery County for sure. Um, but I was fortunate. I was fortunate that I, that I didn't see it as a kid. I don't, I don't think it was going on there as a kid. What about you, RJ? I know, uh, you know, you, you came in volunteering in, in Connecticut, and I think that was primarily up in Cromwell, was a, was a, a uh, all-volunteer station. Um, coming down into Montgomery County as an 18-year-old wide-eyed kid, um, you know, com- coming into one of the busier stations in Montgomery County that, that had, you know, the career uh, aspect in there as well. What, what, what are some of the things that you saw? Did you see any animosities, and, and if so, did, did you see any uh, any changes any what did you witness how did we uh how did those things over did you overcome those yeah so uh growing up in connecticut um obviously uh in connecticut in the north it's a lot different than it is in the south uh, you talk to guys in the south they couldn't understand how they operate in the north and you talk to guys in the north they don't understand how we operate in the south you talk to me i understand both because i'm from both right so uh, I grew up uh, in a career household. My dad is a career firefighter. My dad doesn't volunteer. And where I'm from, you're either all career or all volunteer. Um, when you come down to the South, like like I did at 18 years old, living in a firehouse, and you f- realize you have people who are career firemen in one jurisdiction and volunteer firefighters in another jurisdiction, to the people in the north, that's unheard of. That that that, that don't happen, right? Uh, and to me, the way I look at it as, I look at it as you have people who are so passionate that they can't stop doing the job. That's the way I look at it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you're a career fireman somewhere, but you just can't get enough of it. That you want to do it somewhere else. And I guess I have a very very different take on it, and I just look at it as a passion, right? I don't look at it as career volunteer. I look at it as a passion. And um, I have found that a lot of the issues that we have in the fire service on the career side, on the volunteer side, a lot of those issues as a young fireman, I I still consider myself young, even though I'm 37 years old, Mm -hmm. been in it for a while. um, I still look at it as Mm -hmm. as as a young fireman. A lot of the issues that I see, and this is 100% my opinion, those issues are not going to be fixed by the people who are on the floor running the calls. Those issues are the ones that are going to be fixed by the administrative sides of the career side, the administrative sides of the volunteer side, the administrative side of the union side. Those are the ones who are fighting the battle. I think when you talk about the type A personality, right, uh, career volunteer, when you look at it as a whole, the whole, the fire service is a type A personality type of job. So, Everybody is type A people in a type A world trying to do, trying to have control. You know what I mean? I mean, you look at the fire ground, right? Where you have a lot of times issues that happen on the fire ground are all because you have all type A people all trying to do a type A job in one spot. (laughs) All firemen would do firemen shit. Yeah, in one spot, right? So a lot of times you'll you'll have, there's always going to be conflicts. There's always going to be problems. issues but how do we navigate them you know what i mean and and i think that's what the highlight of what you want to talk about today which i think would be cool is uh how do we navigate these issues i think and and you're correct it it has to start at the top and we talk about leadership everybody is a leader it doesn't matter if you've got you know five minutes on the job you got 50 years on the job um everybody has something to contribute um i know when I had some of my issues, career volunteer issues, volunteer career issues, doing doing both sides, um, being young, I didn't know how how do you fix that. Um, I know in Montgomery County, it, it was uh, we had some issues um, with the, the career 
you know, viewed the volunteers as inferior. Um, and it was the same on the other side where the volunteers felt that they were better trained because they were doing it every day and they're there for free and they felt that they were better than the career. Um, we didn't start to see this change until we had the one chief, um, and, and we had many directors, but the, the true one chief was, was Tommy Carr. And we started to institute the command comp program in Montgomery County. Um, and what that did was it was going to ensure that the operational chief officers, career and volunteer, were evaluate, peer evaluated the same. They were taught the same, they had the same class requirements, <clears throat> and they were evaluated the same. So we started at the top and we worked our way down. <clears throat> and what that did was it showed, in my opinion, the people below that were the captains and, and lower that the s senior staff was working towards one goal. Um, so they were setting an example. Everybody was, was doing the same job um, in the senior staff running command, um, and that was a trickle down. You know, you lead by example, and that's, I think, was Tommy's goal was to bring everybody on the same page on the senior staff side, and then we'd work our way down. Um, it was bumpy at first, but I think it worked out really well. What happened after that was you started to see the union focus more on what they were getting for their contracts, you know, pay raises, better benefits, better health and wellness. Um, the cool thing about that is, is minus the pay and benefits and things like that, the mental health and wellness, the volunteers benefited from that as well. So what the career guys bargained for and got was a carryover mm -hmm. for the volunteers. They were afforded the same county stuff. Um, so that was a win-win. Um, Finding that common ground, I think, that what we talked about before we started this show was, uh, you know, the fire department, whether you like it or not, it's a political hotbed, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. Um, but you, you come together on a common ground of an issue that affects the fire service and how can we come together to push um, legislation forward that benefits everybody. Um, I remember back in the day, the question E in Montgomery County was, coming together as a county fire service um, where they take the career people who were hired by the, the individual corporations and bring them under the county umbrella. <clears throat> and there was some resistance to that, but it happened anyway. Question E passed, and the firefighters became county employees. Um, there was some contention with that. Um, we fast forward, we went to the ambulance billing. The volunteers were, were truly against it. Um, the career side truly wanted it. We were going to get uh, funding so we could be able to continue to move our EMS program forward. Um, we found some common ground where the monies that we collected for the ambulance billing, the volunteers would get part of that because they were running calls as well um, on their ambulances. So they were getting the benefit of some of that. And they came together and uh, they, they had a, a moment where they could... Um, have an agreement and that ambulance billing passed and uh again we saw a lot more of these animosities kind of melt away um a lot of these career and volunteer chiefs that were kind of toxic uh and trying to gravitate and hold on to the old ways eventually left retired got voted out as chief and you started getting these these volunteers and career people that had come up through a system that could see the cooperation between the career and volunteer it, it just started to move into a positive direction. And when I left um, uh, almost a year ago, um, in my opinion, the career and volunteer relations were fantastic. I mean, most of the fires that I ran, I had volunteers in the car with me, and we, we laughed and carried on. I mean, obviously, when the, when the call was over, um, we got along very well. There was never a power struggle who was in charge. So it took a while, but I'm here to tell you that it can happen. So... From the volunteer side, RJ, what are some of the things that you saw? And I know <clears throat> the station you volunteered at, there, there was some, some animosity there. And how, how did the volunteers come to, the, to recognize how they could share a common ground? All right, so uh, this was my take on it then. Uh, this is my take on it now. I think, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but this is just how I have navigated it. And I think that's... 
Uh, I mean, I would like to say my take has been successful. Some would probably argue that maybe it's not, right? So, like I said, if there's one thing that I don't do, uh, and I am under all of it, is politics, right? I am not a politics. Actually, you guys have a show called Politics and, politics and Tactics that you do <laughs> with my engineer, right? I'm not a part of that. I don't do politics. But it's a political world, like you said. It's a political world, right? And the way I like to think that I navigate is I navigate under the political side of it, right? The fights that are fought, whether career volunteer, those are underneath the people. Oh, I'm sorry, those are above the people who are the ones on the fire trucks, the ones who are going out the door, the ones who are doing the job, right? However, in the firehouse, there has to be some kind of cohesion between the two. At the end of the day, uh, the way I look at it, again, right, wrong, I'm not sure, uh, I volunteer in a combination system. I work in a combination system. The word combination means all kinds of entities working together, right? So I think the biggest thing that I tried to always push for is the fight is not our fight on the floor. It's the people above us. However, we are here together on the floor. So what can we do to work together as the group on the floor, right? Um, training, right? I'm big in training. We're all big in training. Training is a big thing, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're a career or a volunteer, right? The volunteers are going to come in the ride. And in Rockville, where I volunteer at, there's seven days a week. There's seven days a week there's volunteers there, right? There's seven eight different duty nights, and we only have seven days a week, right? So they're going to be there, they're going to ride, right? The career side of it, the career staff of Rockville, there's three, uh, four different shifts, right? They're going to be there, right? They have to ride. So at the end of the day, the two entities are still going to be there. It's a combination, right? So at the end of the day, how do we effectively manage being able to manage a firehouse, right? Because at the end of the day, when we go out the door, we all have to perform. And when we perform, the community doesn't say, oh, that group of people that showed up are career or that group of people that showed up are volunteers. They look at the whole station as a whole with whatever numbers on that door, right? So they're going to say a oh, station three or company three or whatever. Everybody who has threes on their fronts, those are the people that came to my house. So I think the biggest thing is when you look at a training aspect, right, um, as a firefighter, as a officer i think the biggest thing is the training aspect of making sure your career making sure your volunteer are training together um we consistently uh my volunteer firehouse consistently do training on a daily basis a lot of it entails having the career side work with the volunteer side um when it comes down to it when we think about how we perform on these calls how we perform on these calls is based on how we train how we train together because when we show up on these calls, we're essentially showing up together as two, diff two different entities working together for one cause. So I think what it, to answer your question, what it boils down to is we start on our level, what we can control in the firehouse, and these are the type of things that we can control, right? The, the, the training aspect, the, uh, uh, the camaraderie, the, uh, the brotherhood, sisterhood, everybody doing things together in the firehouse, right? Because the... The, the battle is bigger than us, for me, as a firefighter, as an officer, on the floor level, right? That's where you have your administrative side of things, like uh, your current position now, uh, where you have to uh, work for uh, a volunteer entity and work together with a career entity to bring the two sides together. I think that when you look at the big picture of it, a lot of people sometimes forget that that's how it used to be way back then when you had so many different separated organizations and then now you implement a career organization years later. Learning how to work together was the hardest part, right? But I, I don't, maybe I, I don't know how, where the mesh the two sides together, but on my end, I think the, the best way you can mesh it is in the firehouse, right? Doing things like training, doing things like working together, that kind of stuff. So Sam, you you work in a predominantly heavily volunteer participation battalion, for lack of better words, um, in in the fourth battalion. Uh, I know I floated through that. So you, there's a lot of volunteer chiefs there. There's a lot of volunteers there. There's a lot of of day work or on nights and weekends where the the volunteers come in. Um, 
have you bumped into anything or, or is it moving smooth? I know when I was there, it actually moved pretty smooth. Um, we built those relationships for the volunteers felt comfortable calling the career battalion chief if there was an issue to, to help solve. A lot of times they just wanted to be heard. Anything that you bumped up against it or is it still, you know, business as usual there? It is. It's business as usual. I, I uh, the, uh, you know, we, we take up from the fire ground, the, vol the volunteer uh, firefighters get the same hugs my, my career firefighters do. You know, um, the only difference is I'm, uh, you know, I track the professional development um, of uh, the career folks because they're under my command and I make sure they have everything they need. Uh, and my uh, colleagues, um, both Chief Dempsey at Wheaton and um, Chief Connell at, at uh, Kensington, um, they, they make sure their folks have what they need and we work you know we work together it's it was then listening to what rj was saying you know it's always i think we do a great job in our combination departments both frederick and and montgomery in putting what's best uh, the best interests of the community first we always do that going out the door and like rj said you know it this the any any of the 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 in-station cut stuff is gone we we I haven't seen that in Montgomery County yeah. in many, many years. Um, you know, it's it's the political thing, and the, what they're working on is literally how how best can we serve the community as a fire department with you know uh, twelve hundred plus career members and nineteen volunteer corporations and you know a couple thousand volunteers. How can we best serve the citizens of Montgomery County, the five hundred twenty one square miles of our of our uh, response area? Um, how can we best serve those citizens together? And I think we, I think we do a great job of it. And I think you know the whole top down thing. Our fire chief, he, um, career volunteer. It doesn't matter. Everybody has the same access to training, technology, apparatus, personnel, and it's it's really a. I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, and back to the you know in the station thing. The way I always solved. You know, you're talking about every once in a while there's a little bit of growing pains, and a lot of times it was. It's personalities, right? Um, I always said, look, uh, the minute you and I get through this, open the back door of this firehouse and put our gear on the rigs, five minutes later I'm pulling you out of a out of a hole in a burning basement, or you're or you're pulling me out, and that and that's how we have to treat each other. Yeah. You know, um, I've seen people these big personality conflicts. I've pulled them in the office. Look, hey, knock knock this shit off. We're done. B, realize that when you come in this firehouse, I don't care if you're being compensated or not, if you're with an, uh, the Rockville Volunteer Fire Company or the MCF or the, uh, you know, the, the Department of Fire Rescue under MCFRS, it doesn't matter. When we go out this door, I've got your ass and you've got my ass. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it has. That's the way it absolutely has to happen. And I think we do a great job of doing that. I think I think we do. <clears throat> and, and, and in the grand scheme of things, right, as I look at it as a career from the career side of it, right? As a career officer, the volunteer system, ain't, no two parts are going away, right? Ain't no, and there's no two parts that are going away. <laughs> so as an officer, as a career officer, the best thing that I can do is teach the volunteer entity what I want them to know, right? They want to ride. They're going to be there. The best thing I can do is teach them what they want to know, what they what. What they can do to be good, because regardless, if I like it or not, they're riding with me. So I want them to be able to get the same training that any career firefighter is going to get. I want them to be good because they're going to be riding with me. Again, when we all show up, nobody looks at whose career, who volunteered. They look at the company as a whole. So if I have three people that are career firefighters, right, well... They got all, at a minimum, a base level of training, right? I t start throwing in one, two extra more volunteer firefighters, right? They might have had a different level of base minimal training. But as a officer, it's on me to make sure that I teach them what extra they need to be good, right? How much more effective can I be as an engine company on a fire ground with five people Versus three people, right? And how much faster can I get a line in place? How much more work can I do quicker with having those five people? And let me add by saying five trained people, right? Because if I train those two extra volunteers to know how to effectively be a good backup person, 
right? Help me get holes up to where I need to be or do whatever tasks I need to be, right? As a whole, the whole team looks good. And I think that's what we can control on our level of the firehouse, right? And I think it's contagious, right? Just like much, much of everything else in the fire service is contagious, right? So companies see other companies managing this and they look good, right? And they said, man, those guys from over there, that company, man, they got five guys, right? Three guys are career guys, two guys are volunteers, but damn, they got a line in place quick, right? And they got the job done quick. That shows, right? In Frederick County, we have a very good group of young, motivated volunteers who come in, right? And when I was assigned to Station 3, it was nice, man, to have a fourth on the rescue squad. The guy was a volunteer. It was nice to have four on the rescue squad, right? I had one person who had cutters, one person who had spreaders, right? And it was on us as career guys to train that boy to be good. Now, I thought he ended up turning out to be a great, you know, squad guy because we trained that guy to be what he wanted. There's a lot of guys who are on the job in Frederick County who started as volunteer firefighters, right? And they came in, they attached themselves to a shift, and they felt like a part of the shift. A lot of the career stations or a lot of the career shifts, they brought those volunteers in like, like they were a part of the shift, right? Because we can do more when we have the volunteers there, but you got to train them, right? And to be honest with you, as a volunteer, at least in my mind, uh, I don't want to come in and just hang out. So I want to come in, and if you guys are doing something, if you guys are doing a cool training, I want to get in on it, right? I, I don't want to come in and hang out. For the majority of the people, and I, you know, it doesn't hold true to everybody, but the majority of the people, they want to do shit, mm -hmm. right? They want to do shit. So when they feel included, you include them in, you're teaching them what they need to know, right? Again, the whole team, the whole group looks successful. So I think it's huge when we look at how the entities work together, how we manage them, career or volunteer. But again, from what we can control, we control that aspect of it, right? We bring those sides together on the fire, in the firehouse, on the fire floor. And that's how I think you spread that whole message across the board. It's funny because I was getting ready to, to say the same thing. Maybe you and I, because I'm getting old, maybe you and I talked about this not too long ago, but I was getting ready to say the exact same thing. I remember being at Rockville as a captain at Station 3, and I would have some of the career guys come to me and, and bitch and complain about having to train volunteers. You know, they'd come, they'd have their training packet to, to learn to ride. Um, they'd come during the day, and they'd ask if they could help. And some of the career guys were bitching about it. And, and I, I said the exact same thing. I said, why wouldn't you yeah. want to train that guy or girl to be good yeah. that's going to come around during the day and ride the fire engine with you? Yeah. And you have trained them to be an unofficial part of your shift. So when they come in and they ride a tower, you know if they're riding the irons or if they're riding hook and can, they're bringing the right tools and they're doing the right job and you don't have to supervise let's, them directly. Let's, let's be honest about this, right? Let's be honest about this. The majority of those young volunteers who come in, who want it, and want more, and want more, they get so engrossed into it, right? And they like it so much, what ends up happening? They get hired. They get hired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Then they turn around, right? You look at like a lot. There's so many good dudes, starting from a couple of our chiefs, some of the technicians, some of the officers that, that work, in, work in Frederick County started as volunteers that just literally attached themselves to the shifts that became a part of it and loved it so much that they turn around and apply for the job, they get the job, they successfully go through recruit school, right? And they come out of recruit school. First of all, they went in recruit school with knowledge and experience. They were leaders in their recruit school. They come out of recruit school and now they're stand-up people, yeah. right? So essentially, now they're working with you. Right. They're just collecting the paycheck. Before, they were working with you, and they weren't collecting one. what I say? They're not going away. <laughs> they, they you know what I'm saying? Be, they're not, the two sides aren't going away. They want to be there. So, you know, and that's, I, once I got my guys over that whole heartburn of you know, <coughs> training the volunteers, like, you know, it's like, why wouldn't you want to train the volunteers? You see it on the, you see it on the side where you'll hear um, these hardcore career guys that are against uh, 
uh, volunteers coming in. It's like, you know, they're taking jobs from us and, and, and all that. So they're taking food off my table. And, and I'm like, we are constantly begging for more staffing. And you end up, you're riding three on an engine company. And you have two volunteers that come in and they want to ride the engine. Instead of crapping on those guys because they're volunteers, train them. And now you've got a five-man engine company, just like you talked about a few minutes ago, RJ. Why embrace the fact that now you've got a five-man engine company? It doesn't matter if the five guys are collecting a paycheck or if only three of them are collecting a paycheck and two are doing it for low sap. It, it, to me, it always boggled my mind that they would bitch and complain about not having enough staffing on the apparatus, but when a volunteer comes in and wants to ride, it's like, well, I don't want that staffing. I want them to be collecting a paycheck. And let's be honest, we know that we've got some turds in the career ranks, just like we do in the volunteer I ranks. want people who want to be there. Yeah. Plain and simple. Yeah. Right? When I worked at three, there was a young boy, and he was uh, an aide on ambulance. And he just liked riding ambulance. That's all he wanted to do. We have three-person staffing in Frederick County. Right? And this boy, the only thing he needed, the only thing he needed to ride aid was a ride to the firehouse. He, had, he didn't have a car. I said, bro, I will pick you up (laughs) and bring you to the firehouse on my way into work. You need to be ready by 5 o'clock. I will pick you up. Now, think about it like this, right? This kid now goes in. He rides aid on the ambulance. What happens? That bumps a career guy off the ambulance. Now you have another career guy riding fourth on a squad or fourth on the engine. Everybody wins. Yeah. Everybody wins. You know what I mean? And and, and, and everybody looks at it as an everybody wins attitude, right? I mean, think about, again, how successful can we be? You got four people on the squad, four people on the engine. Like, that's what I want. I want more bodies that want to do work. I remember being a technician in in Germantown, and we would buy the volunteers dinner that rode the ambulances. If if you're going to stay and ride ambulance, we will buy you dinner. Yes, 100%. Because now that takes two career guys, and let's face it, they didn't want to be on the ambulance anyway. Yeah. Now I got one for the truck, one for the engine, or one for the squad, one for the truck. That's $5 well spent. Absolutely. I'll pay $5 for your meal. $6 Six dollars for your meal. Absolutely. For, for me to if be able, stay, to, if you're going to stay all night, and they yeah. wanted to ride the ambulance anyway. Absolutely. So again, it comes down to we we did and continue to need to get over this stigma of us versus them. It, 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 it always it just gave me a headache it, it, that we would have an us versus them mentality if we are all there for the same reason, we're type A personalities. And I'll be honest with you. We want to go to fires. That's it. We want to go to rescues. Now I'll do cut jobs. Now that we're chief jobs. officers, <laughs> now that I'll we're, do cut jobs. we're chief officers, <laughs> we don't say we want to burn someone's house down because that's irresponsible. We say if someone's house is on fire, well, I'd like to be there yes. when that happens. Um, yeah. We all want to do the same thing. If you have volunteers that are at the firehouse that don't want to run calls. Why are they there to begin with? You can go volunteer your time at YMCA or Boy, you know, Big Brothers or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Teacher Every, and and everybody they, wants to run calls. There's, there's some of them out there, right? There's some, there's some people that don't want to do that. They want to just say that they're helping their community, and that's fine. You know, between all of us, we, we can pick up on those ones who's who, right? And I think the people in the firehouses can pick up on who's who. But the ones who are there who want to do stuff, we can, we can see through that. And those are the ones that we want to help. We want to train. There, there's to more there that want to run calls than that don't want to run calls. Sure. The ones that don't want in the volunteer organizations, you've got admin people that can help fundraising. That can yep. you know help set up events and stuff like that. So there's a, there's room for everybody. But this whole, I just I, I we have to get over the us versus them mentality because we're all there for the same thing. And we can be honest. If the career people left today in a combination system, the fire service would fail. If the volunteers left today in a combination system, the fire service would fail. We don't have the funding. We don't have the manpower. We don't have people taking tests right now to become career people. We have to do it together in these combination systems. And uh, it's a combination for a reason. And it's not going anywhere. I've said it many times to these Chiefs and officers that are that are down on the volunteers are coming in there. I, I tell them, I say, where do you think you work? You know, the Mid Atlantic. RJ calls it the South. I'm gonna tell you right now, we're the Mid Atlantic. <laughs> but the Mid Atlantic region, I, I would say, and that. and somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but the Mid Atlantic has the most combination systems with the most manpower in the United States. I, I would say the Washington metro area has the largest combination systems in the country. 
And um, it's been that way for a long, long time. It's not going anywhere, not in our lifetime. No. So I, 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 we have to get over this us versus them mentality, career versus volunteer. And, and I think training is the key. It's a, it's, you use the word mentality, and it's probably the best word to use. It is a mentality. Because if you think about it, right, look at, look at Frederick County. Frederick County is a whole, right? Frederick County is the largest county in the state of Maryland. Frederick County has a lot of the oldest anything, right? Uh, Frederick County has the one of the oldest firehouses in the nation. Frederick County has one of the oldest volunteer fire companies in the state of Maryland, right? Frederick, Frederick County has an old, a, a lot of old everything, right? And a lot of that comes from people who come up into that system from then. It's been something that's been ingrained from this person to that person, that person to this person. It becomes a way of life or a, as you would call it, mentality. So the, the word mentality is pretty much what it is, right? But at the end of the day, I, I like to say just because this firehouse has been around since 1845 doesn't mean we need to act like it's 1845. It's 2022, <laughs> right. right? Because this yeah. firehouse has been around since 1818 doesn't mean we need to act like it's fucking 1818, right? right. right? So it is, Dave. It's a mentality. Um, but I think as with any mentality... Mentalities can be changed, right? Mentalities can be changed based off of attitude, right? Uh, m- mindset and performance, right? Yeah. Like, you know, Station 2, for example, in Frederick County, right? Station 2 has a bunch of uh, young volunteers who come in, who consistently want to jump in and ride with the guys, be a part of the shift, uh, attach themselves to a shift, and, and literally just feel a part of it. Who wouldn't want that? I just don't get it. Who wouldn't want that? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and so you're right, Dave. It's a it's a mentality. I think mentalities can be changed. Mentalities can be uh you know, just something that it, it, I don't know. I guess I, you're right. It's a mentality. Sam, let's let's talk a little bit about the command comp program in Montgomery County. I, I was heavily involved with that when I was there. I know you are now as well. Um, it is coming to Frederick County. We've just advertised a uh, command comp manager. Uh, it's a civilian program, but they're going to manage that program, kind of what uh, what Kelvin Thomas was doing on the uh, in the Montgomery County at the Train Academy. So, what have you noticed? You know, as going from captain to battalion chief, you've been a battalion chief for a while now. Working with the volunteers in that command comp program, and, and how have you seen that solidify relationships? I think it's great because. Um there are, you know, your, your assessors are career and volunteer. And, um, you know, when I, when I went both, uh, participating as a, as a dispatcher, uh, or as a, um, yeah, as a dispatcher really is what I did. So, you know, set up, set up for dispatch, make sure everything runs right. Um, watch the, the, uh, assessors, evaluators and, uh, and the people coming through it, you know, it, it's, everybody takes, um, everybody takes the, the, the feedback very well, regardless of who it is, because they know they've, they've heard, okay, well, um, you know, Chief Vagonis is, is, uh, from Rockville is one of my uh, assessors. I just heard him run a two banger last night. And, and actually, um, you know, some of my people were on it they did great and he sounded great and it sounded like everything went well. There's really, if, if somebody listened to the radio in Montgomery County or came to command comp and didn't know. Whether you're a career volunteer, you it, it, you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to distinguish. There's no way there's no way to do it. We're we're all doing the same thing. It's great. The other day I had a um, you know pretty uh, serious CO leak in a in a retirement community high rise, uh, fully occupied, um, and uh, the second chief in the car was uh, one of the volunteer chiefs from Kensington, uh, Rob King, who I work great with. He's you know top notch, and. Uh, if you, if I wasn't in a, a white button down shirt, actually I think I just had a white t shirt on. But I didn't have my white t shirt on. Uh, we won't tell Charles. Yeah, and he didn't he didn't have his Kensington <laughs> shirt on, and we and let's say he was in the driver's seat, and I was in the passenger. You you, you wouldn't know the difference. Um, certainly not on the radio, and uh, you know when you establish these relation when you when you build these relationships, um, it's it's awesome because you know I I, I got no worries. I show up on the scene. If the second chief is is uh, one of the other career battalion chiefs, I know I'm good. Everybody around me, and uh, if it's one of the volunteer chiefs, I'm I'm, I'm stoked as well. You know, it's, it, and uh, we work great together. 
And, and it's, it's because of Command Comp. They go in, we go in, we go through the same process. We take the same evaluation, we go through the same, same uh, event simulation, and get the same feedback. And, it, yeah, it's awesome. You know, my challenge to the, the, the tens and tens of listeners that are listening to this podcast um, is... Can you say tens and tens? <laughs> <laughs> You're an idiot. He meant tens of, it, was a, it was a slip. He meant tens, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. The, uh, my challenge to the... This thing on TikTok, the, man. We'll, 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 we'll pop line, off. Right, to the line officers. <laughs> career and volunteer line officers. My challenge to you guys is to get over the us versus them mentality and start setting the example. And whether you believe it or not, people are watching you as an officer, as a chief officer in the senior staff, as a battalion chief, as a captain, as a lieutenant, as a leader of your organization, career volunteer, the rank and file is watching what you do. And if you allow and and put out this air of us versus them mentality. I don't like volunteers or I don't like career. And that's what you put out. These younger members that are coming in, they're going to gravitate towards that. So my challenge to these officers, career and volunteer, is to start embracing each other as we're here for one goal, and that's to serve the citizens. Now, we know behind the scenes the one goal is we want to go to fires and we want to put fires out, and people think that that's terrible. And I'm going to equate it to like this, so so anybody that's listening to this that's not in the fire service, think of somebody in the military that has trained their entire life to be a jet pilot, to be a fighter pilot in a plane, dropping bombs, dogfights, missiles, and all that. You don't think that those guys are looking forward to doing that? Yep, somebody is going to die. Property is going to be destroyed, but that's what they train for. And that's what we train for in the fire service. We train to go to emergencies and be the tip of the spear, be the ones that mitigate the emergency, be the ones that the people that are going through a crisis, the worst crisis of their life, at that moment have someone to turn to. Career and volunteer, we're there for the same reason, and we need to make sure that we're working together because we are not going to survive if we continue to have the us versus them mentality. And, uh, and like RJ said, he's not a political guy, but everything comes down to politics. The county executives, the mayors, whoever that are, that are in charge of these services, when they start seeing these chinks in the armor, these cracks in, in relationships, you're going to suffer um, through uh, whether it be turnover, where you, that chief might be gone because they can't handle their organization, um, demotions, people getting fired. These are things that uh, that we need to take into some serious consideration. As a union president, you might get voted out because people are just fed up. As a volunteer chief, if you are um, putting forth these animosities between career and volunteer, you might find yourself being just a, a firefighter riding the back step of a fire engine if the corporation finally gets fed up with the way that these things are going. So the challenge is... Stop with the nonsense and the combination system and start embracing each other as firefighters and officers there for, for the same goal. So we're beating this dead horse for 43 minutes, and I think that we've gotten you know what we want out of it. So let's transition to something that we love talking about. Let's talk about some of the training, especially because we're all Capital Fire guys. We're going to talk about some of the Capital Fire training that's coming up and some of the things that we're doing. So First and foremost, I want to talk about the All Halligans class that you just did in West Virginia. It's a brand new class that you, that you put together uh, for Capital Fire. So, so give a little bit of overview of what that is, how that worked out for you, and, and what the takeaways were from that. Cool. So uh, the All Halligans class, uh, I think, uh, hearing a lot of the feedback from the students uh, seemed to be uh, well taken. Um, so the, the, the concept behind the All Halligans class is, as you guys know, we travel a lot. We do a lot of force entry classes, and a lot of the training that we do in our force entry program uh, results uh, pretty much using the Halligan. Uh, one of the biggest problems we notice with every one of our classes is we don't have enough time to spend on just the Halligan. Everything is irons or uh, hooks or doing saws, whatever. We don't have a lot of time to spend with just the Halligan. I've never seen a class in the entire country where you can spend time with just the Halligan. So I thought it was a good idea if we put together a class where everybody could spend time with just the Halligan. And so uh, get this. We reached out to as many 
different companies, different manufacturers as we could to get halogens uh, and use everyone that we could possibly think of in the uh, American Fire Service. And I think we had just shy of 20 different style halogens to include uh, a claw tool, which was the first forceful entry tool ever made in the fire service. Uh, actually, wasn't even designed for the firefighters, but duplicate not, was duplicated. Break into banks, right? <laughs> so we had from the very beginning all the way to everything that we could find uh, to today. Um, the class was strictly using the Halligan. Um, so the, the students got a two-hour presentation on um, the Halligan, the invention of the Halligan, all the tools. If, the, if it had the word Halligan, it got talked about. Halligan tool, Halligan hook, Halligan bar, all of it. Um, so, uh, they spent two hours in the class. We, we talked about the history. We talked about, uh, mechanical advantages. We talked about leverages and we talked about tactics, right? Tactics for inward swinging doors, tactics for outward swinging doors, tactics for added security features. Uh, they were able to get it all. Uh, and then we transitioned to, uh, outside where for the next five hours, they spent forcing doors, uh, breaching, uh, breaching walls. They got to, uh, drive, uh, 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 added security features, off doors, everything. They got it all, but they only can use the Halligan. Uh, what it did was it taught taught people a lot of mechanics using the tool, as well as how can I use my tool to help your tool if we're both still using Halligans. Um, so it was funny that uh, you brought this up, Dave, because I, uh, the very next day after our class, we had a student reach out to us and say that he found in his department a authentic Hugh Halligan Halligan bar that's still in service on their rig. Nobody knew what a true Halligan bar was from Hugh Halligan because nobody had ever been informed of the history. They were able to identify that they were still using true Hugh Halligan Halligan bars on their frontline apparatus because nobody knew the history. And when this dude took the class, he learned all of this went back the next day, applied it to, to what he learned, and found out that they were still using true Halligans. So I think that's a successful class, if you ask me. It's successful uh, if he sends it to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Send us one. You know, but we found that the fire service needed that. We needed time to devote just to that. Um, real quick, I would like to say thank you to uh, all of the different suppliers that helped us uh, I don't want to miss anybody, but um, a lot of different companies uh, help supply us with Halligans. I do want to say thank you to Ridgely uh, Volunteer Fire Department for hosting it at their facilities. Uh, we were able to set up all the props on their property. Um, they were great hosts, took care of our lunch, our, our rehab section, because it was hot. Um, so uh, I would like to say thank you to them. But yeah, it was a, a very, very successful class. I think that we've already had... A bunch of requests for people who want this class uh, in their department, which would be pretty cool. I just don't know if we're going to be able to get 20 different Halligans to all of these different states, but we'll figure it out somehow, some way. Uh, but yeah, it was a very, very great, great class. Yeah. So if anybody's interested in that class, obviously you can look uh, Capital Fire Training up on, on the internet for at uh, CapitalFireTraining.com, as well as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, if you're interested in stuff like that. So, Sam, I want to talk a little bit about your class because uh, it's funny. You did a class on that command communication that we did out in Pennsylvania, and um, we, we were doing the class together, but it wasn't really together until after you finished delivering the class. I'm like, wow, that really ties into what I'm getting ready to talk about. So talk a little bit about your class that you did, that we did out in Pennsylvania, um, with the communication aspect of command and, and things like that and, and uh, how that ties into career volunteer uh, as a leader, whether you're on peace apparatus or you're in a battalion vehicle. Yeah, I think the biggest, the biggest thing I, I wanted to drive home was, you know, even, even if you're only listening to one radio channel or talk group, you get on the scene, uh, you've been driving down the roads, so you've been focusing on driving, you're trying to listen to the radio, get on the scene, you're trying to get a, uh, as much situational awareness as you can get as, as you're pulling up. And um, that usually initially you're alone, and uh, the whole point is um, it's okay to be overwhelmed, and you have to, you have to uh, realize that you're going to miss things. And uh, how do you overcome that, uh, over, overcome missing things? You, you welcome the help. So if you're, uh, if you're in a smaller department where um, maybe you only have one chief showing up, 
you can always, uh, I, the one example I used was, you know, my home department um, had some older guys that, uh, actually we had one, the uh, uh, Fish Powell, who was the mayor of Ocean City at one time, lifelong volunteer firefighter, he um, he would come and ride, and this is in the 90s, and he was in his, he was well, he was probably in his 70s at that point. He didn't want to drive the pumper, but he could still pump, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so you take a small department, you might have a retired guy it's not really, um, and maybe he is one of your drivers, but he's at that point where it's like, you know what, um, I'm going to step back. I got young, these young guys, let them drive, that kind of stuff. And get them in the car with you. Get them to be your second set of eyes. Get them to do a circle check before you come back, give you the information, help you with charting. We're, we're lucky um, where, you know, both in Frederick and Montgomery, you know, we show up, we're, we've got chiefs coming. And if it's a major incident, we've got a lot of chiefs coming. But that second chief Especially in the car. Especially if it's close to headquarters, right, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. You're getting everybody coming. Yep. But, um, yeah, the way the way you overcome missing things, the best way to do it, um, other than practicing, and you got to practice this stuff, uh, is having that second set of eyes, that second set of ears in the car with you, and uh, that's that person that bounces stuff off of. And if it's not a second chief, that's okay. Um, the other day on that CO call, the, the second, the only other person there for the first couple minutes was a uh, EMS duty officer. I bounced some things off him. He threw some stuff at me until a uh, uh, volunteer chief King got there and got in with me and, and formed out our command team. But uh, yeah, that was the whole, whole intent of that program was here, here's, here's uh, you're going to miss things and here's some tools um, that you can use to not miss things. Yeah. <laughs> and, and those, those tools came in hand and that's kind of meshed in where we talked about multitasking and you know how how firemen think that they're really good at multitasking but when you're throwing a lot of of uh, of things quickly emergency things quickly uh things start to fall through the gap so having that second person there to hear and whatnot is um it makes it uh makes the operation run a little smoother you know you, you get overwhelmed pretty quick when you arrive on the scene trying to track you know all the units that are there and with the unit numbers and, and where they are um so a lot of times you have to slow that incident down so you're running the incident so the incident's not running you. And, and I think that uh, understanding that, yes, you're going to be overwhelmed uh, for the first five, ten minutes, and then things will start to, to even out. And, and, again, take advantage of those older members that may not be riding anymore but still have a wealth of knowledge of things that they've seen. They can be your extra set of eyes. They can listen to the radio, might hear things that you're missing. I, I've known I've, I've sat – uh, in in the battalion vehicle or, or in the command vehicle and uh, a unit will call. And the incident commander might not even hear it. I'm going to turn around and say, hey, man, uh, you know, uh, in, engine 731 just called you. you know, we're looking for you. Oh, okay, my bad. You know, didn't hear it. Um, those things are important. Um, it allows you to you can keep that radio chatter down so that unit's not calling again and again. Um but having that that second person in the car gives you that situational awareness. Yeah, yeah. Um, so coming down to the end, we're gonna wrap it up a little bit here. Um, talk a little bit about the training um, with the uh, you know some of the things that we did. We we went out to FDIC. Uh, we gave that command program. I think that was pretty successful. Um, the amount of people that were there. Um, RJ had his all Halligans class. We've got a bunch of things that are coming up. Our calendars are filling up. Um, you know, with uh, with forcible entry, with the uh, the command class. I think we got a trucks class coming up. I know we've got uh, some uh, rapid intervention stuff that's coming up. Uh, we're going up. Yeah. So uh, we we do our uh, the rest of our year is going to be uh, pretty slammed with capital. Um, we've already started taking on uh, some stuff for next year. Uh, we'll be back out in Ridgely in September. At the end of September, uh, they're gonna uh, we're gonna do a, a, a live burn with them uh, and those guys. Uh, and then literally that week, uh, following week, we'll be at uh, Firehouse Expo in Ohio. We'll be doing uh, our Down and Dirty Urban Urban Force Frontier class out there with them. Um, October will be in Providence. So uh, any of you guys listening, if you live anywhere in the north, we'll be in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. We're going to be doing our Down and Dirty Urban Force Muncher class at the uh, Providence Safety and Survival Conference, which is a very, very cool program. They, uh, they've been doing, so they've been doing this program for many, many years. Actually, in fact, I remember my dad uh, was uh, going to these trainings back in the day when I was a younger guy, um, which I think is pretty cool now that I get to teach with uh, you guys at, at this event. 
Um, but they uh, they stopped doing it for a couple years. They just brought it back uh, last year, the year before. Uh, so they, uh, in fact, uh, some of the guys who are uh, on the board for the Providence uh, program took our class in Nashville. Um, and that's how we got asked to come up there and teach. So we'll be up in um, in Rhode Island in October. Uh, that's October 15th and 16th. If you guys get a chance, check them out on um, Instagram. They have a website. Um, it's the uh, Providence Safety and Survival Conference. Uh, I think registration opens up in a few weeks for that um, conference, and it goes very quick. So um, if you guys are thinking about it, it's a cool, uh, cool program. We will then... Um, be doing a, a event in um, Georgia, and that is uh, with the guys from Bears of the Oak, Shane Bentley, and all those guys. We're going to be doing um, some uh, engine and truck ops live fire um, down in Dalton, Georgia. Uh, so we'll be linking up with those guys down in November. And the middle of November, we'll be in uh, Maysville, West Virginia, doing a RIT class with those guys. Um, one of our uh, good programs that we do with uh, retired Captain Tony Chicarico, Kevin Larkins, and uh, Hank Kenline from uh, Frederick County. So, yeah, we got a lot going on for the year. Um, we are going to be, like I said, wrapping up the year with about five different trainings we have and already started transitioning into uh, programs for next year. So we got a, we got a lot on our plate. Um, so, yeah. And it was, soon as, it was like when, as soon as the COVID restrictions kind of eased up, the phone didn't stop ringing. Yeah. Um, Everybody's playing catch up. It was yeah. as tragic as, as the COVID was. Um, it, it allowed us to take on so many more classes that it also allowed us to expand our instructor cadre. I mean, what, for 11, 12 years, it was just like six of us. Yeah. So I think we're up to what, 10 or 12 now? No, we're up to uh, 14 now. Oh, we have 14. Uh, instructors total um, and uh, also with that we were able to expand how we teach uh, we have a zoom platform now where we can do classes uh, virtual uh, and we're in the process of uh, setting those up we haven't done one yet but uh, working out the logistics between our web guy and uh, registrations and all that so we uh, still have continuously been able to do uh Different gatherings where we uh, can meet uh, via different platforms. And obviously your podcast has still always been a way to reach people. So we've done pretty well getting uh, information out there to people. I think the, the Zoom thing is going to be pretty cool where it, it really came to light when we were at FDIC. We had a dude come up to me and said, man, we'd really like to get you out and uh, teach some, teach this command stuff. And I asked, where are you, where are you from? And he said... Uh, he said, Oregon. I said, like the state? <laughs> I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, the class cost and then you getting us out there and then housing us and all that, it, it's, uh, it'll it's be pretty pricey. I said, but I know we're working on, on a virtual platform where we yeah. can actually do uh, these classes and consulting and things like that um, for a lot it's it's a little more economical for you, but it also allows us to really expand out where we can start talking to people out in the Midwest and in the West. I mean, don't get us wrong. We don't mind traveling, but it's time away from our families. Yep. It's time away from work. And, and like I tell everybody, you know, I just started working again six months ago. I'm the FNG in Frederick. I ain't got to leave. <laughs> so, uh, but, but this, uh, this zoom platform, when we get that up and running, it's going to be tremendous. So yeah, we're, no, we're working on, that. we're working on it. It's been a, it's been a process. We don't want to just throw it together. We don't want it to be half-assed, but our, the, the one problem we run in with is our, uh, our web guy is light years ahead of us. Um, a lot of us are firemen and the basic technology of it. Uh, and so all of the logistics behind it uh, is a process. It's a process for uh, us to learn it. It's a process for us to put together. But we have a good web guy. Uh, shout out to uh, Dave Collado. So, yeah, um, we're uh, we're getting there. I, I anticipate by uh, the fall we should have it all up and running and working the way we want it to work. Uh, with a couple programs out there for uh, people to uh, do virtual. So, cool. yeah. All right. Well, we're at the one hour mark, guys, and uh, I like to keep it keep it to an hour so guys that are driving back and forth to work they can listen to the podcast. It seems like that's our uh, our uh, our time zone where they're going back and forth to work so they can listen to the first half and then listen to the second half. So again, Sam, RJ, thanks for taking time out of your day. 
it's nice to have you know be here live as opposed to talking on the telephone. Um, so I appreciate you guys coming out here and just you know just talking stuff stuff that's been on my mind that I know that you guys could contribute to. So I appreciate you coming out. Thanks for having us, right on, Yeah. So. With that being said, um, you can check out the new uh, Side Alpha Leadership website. It's sidealphaleadership.com. Uh, there's lots of content on there. Um, the podcasts are actually posted up on there as well as Apple, Spotify, uh, Amazon. Um, you can also look at some of the, uh, the short videos that we had. I call them Side Alpha Leadership Snippets. A bunch of different people talking a little bit about leadership things. Usually last about a minute to two minutes. And then uh, some short uh, leadership um, uh, articles that we put up there, usually about a three or four minute read. So uh, if you get a chance, uh, check out the website. Um, let me know what you think. And with that, guys, thanks a lot for coming. And until next month, be safe. Peace. Peace.